Hey everybody, we're uh, continuing, uh, kind of where we left off with chapter 4. We're very close to being done with chapter 4, uh, Psychoalkanes. Um, I just need to do a couple more things related to um, Psychoalkanes and substituted Psychohexanes, like, you know, if you have equatorial and axial, what, uh, uh, which which isomer, which conformational isomer is maybe the more stable one, for example, right? Uh, we, we knew, we already talked about um, equatorial versus axial and how how um, equatorial is uh, more stable, right? And the reason is whenever you have an R group that's equatorial, um, it's more stable because when it's axial, when the flipped form, so if the flipped cyclohexane puts the substituent axial, you have these 1, 3 diaxials um, interactions, right? So equatorial is good, but and that's that's pretty easy to understand. What if you have two equatorial, or like two different things, like one on one side, one on the other, then you have a competition because the larger one will want to be equatorial, right? The larger one will want to be equatorial. And so if you have a really huge one, like on one side, and maybe uh, kind of a smaller one on the other, then, then if, a, if there is a competition, if like one's axial and one's equatorial, then the, uh, the larger one will really want to be equatorial. That makes sense, right? Okay. Then we did, we showed these delta G values. It's like a, uh, a uh, these are um, kind of like the quantitative extent of the 1, 3 diaxial interaction. 1, 3 diaxial interaction refers to the fact that when it is axial, there's these 1, 3 interactions with the H's. And those are, uh, that's kind of why axial is uh, disfavored, right? And it's a steric interaction, which means it's a through space interaction. And the little parentheses suggest it's a through space interaction. And what we, we saw was like H has a very minimal, it's basically no interaction at all, right? If, it, if it, R is H and it's basically just cyclohexane, well, there's not going to be any difference between one or the other. But methyl is a little larger, 1.7. Ethyl is a little larger than that, 1.75. Isopropyl is at 2.2. Tert-butyl is the huge one with this, you know, massive number. Um, it's, it's larger than... I, there, may, may, there may be other things larger. I can't... Uh, certainly not in this course. In this course, tert-butyl is the big one, all right? And then we have other ones like the halogens that we talked about uh, last time. Um, fluorine is a little, you know, it's a small number. Chlorine is a little larger. Bromine is a little larger than that. Iodine is a little less than bromine, and the, the reason, I think, is due to a longer bond. So the bond is longer, so the interaction is a little less severe, even though iodine is a larger atom, right? That's, I think, the explanation. Okay, cool, and there's more of these in Table 4, 3. Okay, cool. All right, um, and then, and then what, we, what we did last time was, this is just an example, we, we were using this equation that I, I wrote that allows us to figure out what the delta G value is. If I have a left, left side, uh, compound, and a, I mean a left conformational isomer and a right conformational isomer. So what it is is delta G equals the sum of anything that's equatorial on the left, the delta G values, right? So anything on the left that's equatorial, we sum it up. And in this case, you know, you only have an axial CH3, so everything else is H, right? Anything that's equatorial is H, and those are all zero. So, so that's what the zero means. Is everything that's left that's equatorial, we sum it up. And on the right, which we know is the better one because, you know, it's methyl's ax, uh, equatorial, uh, we sum everything up, and, and the, the number is 1.7. And, and so it's 0 minus 1.7. It gives us a negative delta G value, negative 1.7. So that uh, is a right favored equilibrium, right? That makes sense. Negative delta G for, for a, a right favored equilibrium. Okay, remember if it's a positive number, it's left favored. If it's negative, it's right favored. Cool. And I think we did one more last time. Which actually is a competition because now you have a you have bromine versus CH3, right? And you have bromine versus CH3, and um, and of course we know 
that from those numbers we just saw that uh, bromine is smaller, CH3 is larger, so you'd expect CH3 wants to be equatorial. And that's, that's just, you can make that prediction before you even start, right? And if you can make that those kind of predictions, it, it helps you, because then you're just going to double check your prediction. So we do delta G then equals the sum of everything on the left that's equatorial, minus the sum that's everything that's on the right that's equatorial. And so it's 0.55 is the bromine, that's the only thing that's equatorial on the left minus 1.7, which is everything that's equatorial on the right. Do that subtraction, and it's negative 1.15. Makes sense. It's a negative number, which is right favored. Okay? So that was kind of where we got last time. Let's do a couple more problems now, all right? Okay, so let's do a different kind of problem. Here, and, and this is a little more challenging, but we can, we can get through it. Let's look at, we'll go by the name, cis uh, 1 bromo 4 tert butyl cyclohexane. Cis 1 bromo 4 tert butyl cyclohexane. And um, <coughs> this is challenging because we're given the name we have to figure out the structure and um, we have to um, there's there's different ways we can draw this molecule we can either you know, have bromine be equatorial on the left you know like we can we will just decide how to draw this but there's there's multiple ways we can draw this is my point all right so let's show the two flipped forms one bromo four butyl cyclohexane. What is the meaning of cis? What is the meaning of cis? Because the definition of cis has nothing to do with equatorial and axial, right? The definition of cis, what was the definition of it? It's, it's a relative stereochemistry and the definition of cis is same side. So they're either both up or both down, right? But they're not one up, one down. Cis means same side, okay? All right, so, uh, yeah, I'll draw uh, cyclohexane. Let's draw, for cis, one bromo, four tert butyl. Do I want to make uh, bromine down in axial or like up in equatorial? That's the question. Do I want to make bromine down or up? Well, it doesn't matter. All that matters when you say cis is it's going to be the same side. So I, I can pick it one way, but that's going to tell you the orientation of the tert butyl group, right? So let's uh, arbitrarily say that the BR is going to be right there, up. Okay? That's arbitrary. I could make it go down, whatever. And all that's going to do is affect where the tert butyl is. Okay? So if bromine is up in equatorial, then at 4 tert butyl cyclohexane, we have a tert butyl on number 4. Where's 4? It's 1, 2, 3, 4. It's the opposite side. And wh which direction will tert butyl be now? Is it going to be up or down? Because the bromine's going up, and it's cis, so is tert butyl going to be up or down? By definition of cis, it's going to be on the same side as the bromine. So is it going to be, it's going to be here, it's going to be going up. Now the question is, is it going to be axial or equatorial? Well, if I look at this position and I go up, is it axial or equatorial? It cannot be equatorial. Because at this position, you have an up and axial and a down and equatorial, right? Up and axial or down and equatorial. So it has to be up and axial, tributal. There's my, there, there it is, okay? My point here is that you're given freedom to draw this. As long as you draw it correctly, like being cis, there's other ways you could draw this, right? A lot of different ways. Um, and let's try the equilibrium now. Draw the chair flipped form. Hopefully you're getting better at drawing these chair flipped forms.
Okay, it's a little messy, but it works. All right, so that's the chair flip form. Where will BR not be? BR will not be at the bottom left, so maybe I'll put it on the the uh, top left. Okay, BR was a, a up in equatorial, now BR is up in axial. Okay, in the chirp butyl, so if we do this, I, I like to number, you know, to keep my orientation the same. This is one, two, three, four. Now this becomes one, two, three, four. Both are clockwise. Both are clockwise, right? Okay, so chirp butyl now was up in axial. Now it is up in equatorial, right? Okay, without doing any, any um, quantitation, which one is the favored one? We'll quantify it in a second, but which one's the favored one? Which one is the favored one? Um, which one is the favored one? Okay, and the answer is, well, we know Tributyl is massively large with a huge number, right? And it really wants to be equatorial. So yeah, definitely the right sides can be favored. We know that. So we predict the right sides can be favored. Okay, but let's do the delta G now. And that'll tell us, you know, if, if the right side is favored, is delta G going to be positive or negative? It should be negative, right? For the right side favored. Okay, so delta G is equatorial to axial left minus the sum right delta G equatorial to axial. Okay, that's writing out the whole formula. You could just sum uh, uh, right, left minus right. We know what that means. Okay, and uh, what what is the number for bromine? I think we we saw it just now. It was 0 0.55, right? Because bromine is equatorial on the left. And we saw we look for everything that's uh, equatorial on the right, and it's just that uh, tributyl, and that's the huge number. It's five. Oh, cool! It looks like a negative number, just like we expect. I think it's negative 4.45. I think that's right. Double check. 0 0.55 minus 5 is. Negative 4.45. So yes, that's actually a fairly large number, calcareous per mole. For these calculations, it's it's a big number. And I think uh, maybe it's chapter two, but you, you could look at the delta G and the effect of the equilibrium. I think this is this basically means like 99.9 .9 to 0 0.1, 0 0.1. One of those tables in chapter uh, two had the effect of delta G, right? Okay, so that was cool. Yes, you will be doing some problem like this on the uh, uh, quiz, and um, and uh, yes, no. I have a couple more sample problems like this at the very end, so you can try these. Given the name, draw it. Draw the two forms. Make a prediction. You know, is it is it the left or right? It's probably going to be the right in this case because it's tributal, right? And then just do the calculation. It's not that hard, but you need to practice it a couple times. All right. How about... So this was cis one romo 4 tributyl cyclohexane. Uh, let's try trans 1,4-dimethyl cyclohexane. Trans 1,4 dimethyl cyclohexane. So start with my chair, and we'll do it. We'll do, arrange it the same way. You just have you put stuff in the different corners. So trans 1,4 dimethyl means the trans means same side or opposite side. It means opposite side, right? So I will arbitrarily draw this methyl equatorial up, and then at the four position, the methyl has to be what up or down? It's trans can't be up, it's got to be down, right? Definition of trans is opposite. So yeah, there we go. Trans 1,4 dimethyl cyclohexane. Let's put H's in there to make it fun. Flip it. Uh, 
Okay, where's my flipped form? So we'll put the methyls up in the top left and the bottom right. If this was up in equatorial, this has to be up in axial. If this was down in equatorial, this has to be down in axial. Okay, this looks weird. One has both equatorial, which is happy. One has both axial, which is pretty unhappy, right? So this will be pretty easy. We, we know it's going to be left favored. I mean, is delta G going to be positive or negative if it's left favored? Probably going to be positive, right? Delta G equals some left minus some right. Those are the delta G values. And it's uh, for methyl, it's uh, 1.7. So the sum of everything equatorial on the left, we have two of them, so it's 2 times 1.7. Minus the sum that's equator everything equatorial on the right, which is 0. Okay, so it's uh, 3.4 kilocalories per mole. Very cool. I'll do one more, you can you can do it. We'll say isopropyl versus tert butyl. Here I'm giving the, you the structure. Usually I'll give you the name, and there's more practice drawing the name from the name to the structure. But let's just draw the flip forms. Okay, so Isopropyl is up in equatorial, now it'll be up in axial. Terpbutyl is up in axial on the left, and it'll be up in equatorial on the right. Which is bigger? An isopropyl group or a terpbutyl? Uh, well, we know from the table that, yeah, terpbutyl is the biggest of all. So it really does not want to be axial, ever, <laughs> really, right? And so it's going to flip to be equatorial. We can expect this will be the favored one. Do the delta G, and you'll expect probably a negative number. Look up the numbers. Right. I think it's. I think it's two, negative two point eight. After you do the math, but you should uh, recalculate it. Okay. Um, there was a book problem. I don't. Uh, maybe it's. Maybe it's for uh, chapter four problem. For, 37. It asks you kind of about like cis 1 for uh, ditert butyl cyclohexane. Cis 1 for ditert butyl cyclohexane. I think, it's, I think this is the problem number. It's one of the problems in the homework. Um, and it asks you, like, you know, how, how would we draw this and what would be the domida isomer, isomer? Well, this is weird because terpbutyl is so massive. Terpbutyl is so massive and it does not want to be axial, right? So if you look at it, cis 1 4 diterpbutyl cyclohexane, it would be like terpbutyl and then at the 4 position, cis would be, if this is up, this has to be up. And, right? But this is super bad because terpbutyl does not want to be axial, right? So this is a weird case where, one of the very rare cases where it wants to be kind of in these sort of twist boat, uh, non-chair conformations. It's so, so unhappy that it's actually going to adopt something that's not a chair. So remember those weird alternate isomers? I think it's a, a twist boat. It's, you know, there's the boat, which is the transition state, and the slightly twisted versions of the boat are the other ones. Anyway, this is a case where it, it actually is so unhappy as a chair that it, it adopts a non-chair confirmation. Okay. Okay, so we were talking about number uh, seven, which is all the cyclohexanes. Now we're going on to number eight, which is larger cycloalkenes. Larger cycloalkanes. We already talked about this. We're just going to mention it one more time. So, rings 
larger than cyclohexane. That's what we mean by larger. Um, we, we already talked about some of these, so like ring size C7, C8, C9 uh, as an example. And, and the strain per CH2 is like the extra strain, right? And it's these are numbers like 0 0.9 and 1.3 I think 1.4. So there's like extra strain per CH2 as you get larger. And these are 7 membering, 8 membering, 9 membering. Cycloheptane, cyclooctane. And what it would be called if it's C9? It's cyclononane. Cyclononane, okay. And um, what, what was the name of the uh, type of strain with these cycloalkanes? We had a, di a, a, a name for it. There's a name that accounts for the weird strain in large rings. I, I'll just write it. You, we saw this previously. Uh, I'll just draw cyclooctane as an example. Cyc low octane so it's like this carbon and like across the ring that carbon are actually talking to each other and I, I showed you this with models right I built a model of this and I was like well this huge ring cyclooctane those carbons are actually bumping into each other you don't have that with like cyclohexane into the, the chair of confirmation right these carbons are not they're actually far away from each other and they're not f flexible or bumping into each other right so cyclooctane, cycloheptane. How do you how do you draw cycloheptane? So cyclooctane is a stop sign, right? It's a eight carbons in a stop sign configuration. So how do you draw cycloheptane? Cycloheptane, which is seven carbons. I call it a truncated stop sign. So it kind of looks like a stop sign, but rather than have it be a full octagon, it's like this carbon and this carbon. You know, that's seven, seven membering. But these carbons still bump into each other. Th those two carbons bump into each other a little bit, and that creates this, this interaction. And what's the name of the interaction? It's called a trans, transannular strain. Transannular strain, and that just means across the ring. So the, 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 the strain is across the ring. Okay. Um, I think, let's see. So we saw, and we, we made models of, of, of uh, cyclooctane earlier in the, in the course, in the chapter, sorry. And we showed exactly the uh, problem and the, 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 the bumping into, CH2s bumping into each other. Okay. Okay, so number nine, moving forward, number nine is polycyclic alkanes. Polycyclic alkanes. So these are like having maybe a couple rings. Um, two kind of fun ones are um, if we imagine. Two cyclohexanes fused together. What would that look like? So, so you can imagine uh, two cyclohexanes that are kind of fused to each fused together. And an exa the example is uh, these are kind of fun to draw. So you'll you'll probably have to practice drawing the, this a couple times. So. This is uh, two cyclohexanes fused together. And indeed, though, it's, it's not six times two carbons. It's actually ten carbons, right? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But it looks like two cyclohexanes fused, right? Okay. Um, 
and there's stereochemistry at the at the fuse, fusion point, right? So we can imagine kind of two ways to do this. Like I could draw H going towards us and H going away from us, and I could imagine. Maybe H going towards us on the top and coming towards us on the bottom. So those are stereoisomers, right? This one it looks maybe trans, and this looks cis. And, and the the uh, they have a name. This is called transdecalin. So decalin is the name of this thing. This fused two six-member rings, right? And then this one. What do you think it's called? If this is transdecalin, this must be. Cis decalin. Trans decalin, cis decalin. Alright. So, what, how would we draw the three dimensional representation of these? The trans one is very easy. So, let's just draw kind of like a six member ring in chair form, like a cyclohexane. And then let's draw a second one. Like that. That's actually, that's, that's it, right? And where are the two H's? One that's kind of going upward there, and one that's kind of going downward there. All right? That's pretty easy. Cis one is a little difficult. We may have you draw these on the on one of the quizzes. I, I haven't decided yet, but you might. You should practice this and then copy these in your notes also. Okay. So draw a cyclohexane for for cis. And then the way we draw, the way we're going to do this is um, to draw the, this is like the, the right side ring, to draw the left side ring, I kind of go downward from here, not that bad, right? That's going to be part of, of the left ring. And then I'm going to go here, and then I'm going to go down. And then I'm going to go like that. See how I did that? Now it looks like there's two six-member rings. And the H's are, are cis, so one of them is kind of up in axial. Where's the other one? I'll draw it in a different color. Of course, it's at the fusion point, and it's kind of H, like that. That is up and equatorial, right? See how I did that? Sometimes you make this this guy a little bit wider out so that you can make space for the H. But yeah, the H, you have one that's going up in axial and one that's going up in equatorial. I'll draw it one more time just for fun. Try to draw it maybe a little differently. I'll do my left cyclohexane down. Maybe make that a little larger. There we go, and now we have up and a up H, and that's up and uh, one's up in axial, the other is uh, up in equatorial. But these are cis decalon, all right? Can they flip? Can these flip the way that normal cyclohexane can flip? The answer is no. the 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 fusion locks it. It's locked. Um, it cannot flip. It cannot flip. Okay. The fusion prevents it from flipping. There's no way that this could be flipped to some other form, right? Because one, one ring locks the other and vice versa, okay? You cannot flip them. Like the way we drew other cyclohexanes flipping. Okay, uh, what about one more example? Uh, these fused cycloalkanes are the basis of steroids. So steroids are used in a lot of as, as uh, hormones in our body, and also they're used in developmental biology to uh, for the kind of causes like uh, masculine and feminine. Uh, uh, Sex characteristics and vertebrates. Okay, and let's draw one in, in a two-dimensional form, and then we'll draw it in a three-dimensional form. 
So we're going to draw epiandosterone, which is has a six-member ring there. Another six-member ring fused. Another six-member ring fused. And a five-member ring. And you got a ketone, you got a methyl group coming up here, and a methyl group coming up here. You have a hydroxy group coming towards us here. This is epiandosterone. It's also in the textbook, and you can see the structure. But for fun, let's draw that. Let's try to make a three dimensional model of this on our paper. Um, all right, so I'm going to start with, maybe we'll label as A, B, C, and D. We're going to start with A, and then build the B, and then the C, and then the D. So let's draw a chair form for A. There's A. And then where's B? So B is fused off A. So it's kind of like... Focus on really nice chairs, keep the lines parallel, all right? And then we got C, A, B, C, and then we got the D, which is a five-member ring. And five-member rings don't have chair forms. Remember, it's kind of they have a little different structure. To draw the five-member ring, we're just gonna kind of build a little pentagon right there. There's the ketone. You got a methyl going up here. You got a methyl going up here. And you have the hydroxy group up in equatorial right there. Okay. You're not going to have to worry about doing this on quizzes or exams, but it's, it's a fun thing that we can kind of do now that we know how to draw chair forms of cyclohexanes. And, and uh, they, they're all kind of fused like this. Of course, we have an H right there down. And we got an H in the back there, we have an H there, etc. So there's all sorts of H's around here, okay? But these are, it should be a chair, chair, and a chair. Those are semi-okay chairs. I didn't, they're not my best chairs in the world. Uh, and the, uh, the textbook has a nice drawing of this that we can look at also. All right, so this is from my little PowerPoint slide collection that you guys have access to on my website. This is that same molecule, um, and I just realized I misspelled it on my notes. I said epiandosterone, but it's actually epiandrosterone. There's that, that R there, you can see it. Anyway, this just shows the sort of two-dimensional representation with the, the stereochemistry at each of the positions. The wedge means it's coming towards you, the dashes mean it's going away from you. Um, all right, and the R O R basically means, as you can see, when when R is equal to H, that is the uh, the molecule, the alcohol, right? R equals H, and uh, and so then we have uh, this shows the this shows the uh, three dimensional representation where you have the A B C and D rings and all the stereochemistry. So it's kind of like a, you know, a chair, a chair, a chair, and then the five-member ring adopts kind of a, you know, five-member rings don't have chairs. Uh, and uh, another little tidbit about, about steroid nomenclature, the things that are coming upward or like uh, towards you are called beta, so that you have a beta CH3 that is a beta hydrogen, that's a beta CH3. The things that are going downward are alpha. So alpha means going down, beta means going up. It's just a historical nomenclature for steroids, okay? And then this shows a, sort of a three-dimensional model of it, like a computer-generated three-dimensional model. It's super cool that we can do this kind of stuff by, um, uh, with a computer, really easily we can create a three-dimensional model like this, all right? Okay, so then um, these are some more examples of the, back to the cyclohexane stuff, of uh, things you might see on quizzes or exams in this course. 
Consider the following cyclohexane derivatives. Trans, 1 bromo, 2 isopropyl uh, cyclohexane as one. Be able to draw these. Draw it out. Start with cyclohexane, and then, and then you just draw the trans to show the rel the you know trans means opposite orientation. One bromo, two isopropyl. Cis, one chloro, three tert-butyl cyclohexane. You can draw that. Trans, one chloro, three tert-butyl cyclohexane. Um, also, these are all good practice. Try to do these, and then do the delta G. So the t typical things you'd be doing are for each of the molecules above, do the following. Draw the two possible chair flipped molecules with all the hydrogen shown. Calculate the delta G value uh, for, the, the, for the equation shown in A, like up here. And write the word major or uh, write the word major around the major chair flipped form. And you, you also need the delta G value. So these are really good practice problems. All right. Uh, now on quizzes, uh, you'd be giving a, given a table that looks like this. You, of course, you guys have all these numbers as well, but I usually give these numbers to you. The main ones you usually need are CH3, um, you know, methyl, ethyl, isopropyl, tert-butyl, right? The other ones we haven't really addressed, but they're just other numbers. And then the halogens, of course. Fluorine is small, chlorine's larger, bromine's larger. Iodine's a little less than bromine due to the bond length. So yeah, anyway, that's those are some fun types of problems you might see on the, the quizzes or exams, right? Cool. Alright, we're on to chapter 5, which is on uh, stereoisomers. Stereochemistry. Right, and we've talked a little bit about stereoisomers and stereochemistry already. It just kind of has to deal with the uh, three dimensionality of molecules. Three dimensionality, right? We talked about a little the, the dashes and the wedges and stuff. Well, we're going to go into pretty extreme detail. Uh, into all this now. Uh, as a good starting point, uh, consider your hand. Hands. And kind of the relationship of your hands. And I'm going to draw really terrible depictions of hands. So there's my thumb. Alright, and here's my other hand. Alright, so when you have your hands, uh, your hands look, seem identical, but they're actually not identical. They're, uh, what's the relationship of your hands? They're uh, mirror images of each other, right? It's not like your left hand is the same as your right hand. They're, they're mirror images of each other. Um, they're I mirror images that are not superimposable. So molecules can do this too. There are molecules that are mirror images that can, that are not superimposable. Right? So if I if I take my hands, I can't like like put my left hand on. Uh, there's no way to superimpose my left hand on my right hand because they're mirror images of each other, right? But um, other things like in nature are superimposable. Like if I have a like a rubber ball, like, you know, I've, if I have uh, Imagine a rubber ball, and I imagine the mirror image of the rubber ball. That should typically be uh, superimposable on it. Anyway, anyway, we're going to see the same kind of property with molecules. But your hands are a good starting point. All right. Um, so let's talk about isomers again. Review on isomers different kinds of isomers. So what are the different kinds of isomers? We had constitutional isomers. 
which have the same molecular formula but different connectivity. Right? And so we had an example of like C5H, uh, oops, yeah, C5H12. Is that cyclic or acyclic? You, you know that from the molecular formula, right? Or, yeah, it's, well, it, if it has CX H2X plus 2, which this does, right? Um, then it's saturated, and that means there's no rings. But if you have a la uh, you know fewer hydrogens, like if we have C C five H ten, then that could be accounted for by a ring or a double bond or something, right? But C five H twelve is called saturated, so it's just full of hydrogens and and there's no rings. And so I could draw pentane as an example, C five H twelve, right? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Um, I could also do like that. I could do that. But I can't draw like a cyclopentane. That wouldn't work. Like if I, if I did C, like cyclopentane, that would be C5H10 and that won't work. So I can't do that. All right. All right. And we did that. We talked about all the isomers of cyclopentane the last time. Uh, let's talk about stereoisomers now and, and what we learned last chapter. Stereoisomers. So, you know, that what you what you learned last chapter was like if I have um, cyclobutane, one bromo, two chloro, cyclobutane, um, I could draw this in two different stereoisomeric forms, right? And one of those we called cis, one of them we called trans. This is the cis one. This is the trans one. So that's an example of stereoisomers. The connectivity is the same, but the three-dimensional arrangement is different. Okay. Um, the book mentions another type of stereoisomer, which are, are these rotational isomers of like butane. Remember this? Newman's? What's that one called? It's butane, four carbons, everything's far apart, is the anti. And if we rotate it, like we could do gauche. Gauche butane, which is the happy one, anti or gauche? Of course, the anti is the happiest because the CH3s are the furthest apart, right? Um, and these guys are kind of bumping into each other. So are these stereoisomers? Is is anti butane um, a stereoisomer of gauche butane? The book says it is that, that they're actually they're, they're, that rotational isomers are c considered stereoisomers. I want to say it's debatable because it's a different. It's much more uh, I'd say different than like this, where, where these things are locked. It's like not like this can interconvert or anything like that. Anyway, so I, I want to say that this situation where like anti-butane and gauche butane are are interconvertible, right? They rotate. Um, Book says they're also stereoisomers. I, I kind of disagree, and I, I, I've seen it kind of argued both ways. Um, but anyway, when you see it in the book, they're going to say, "Oh yeah, these are these are examples of stereoisomers." I think this is a more um, more uh, clear-cut example of a stereoisomer. And the same connectivity, different three-dimensionality. Okay.
Okay, and we're still introducing the chapter, then I'll get into my little numbery section points, but we're we're in introduction mode. So let's talk about this this kind of type of stereoisomerism. Mirror image isomerism. Mirror image isomerism. Mirror image isomerism and the concept of chirality. Chirality. So what are what are we talking about? Um, let's let, let's show an example of it. And I'll, I'll uh, I will show you models of this in a second too. So imagine methane or uh, methyl and C H chlorine Br. Okay, and so the dash 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 means going away, the wedge is coming towards you. And I'm going to draw this in kind of two different forms. And the chlorine is coming straight towards us, the bromine is going straight away. It's not like this is to the left or right. These are not to the left and right. Chlorine is coming straight towards us, the BR is going straight away, straight in the back. Okay, that's important when you're, when you're considering this. The meaning of this. Bromine is straight back, chlorine is straight forward. Okay. Uh, I could draw a different f molecule. All right, what's the relationship of these two molecules? In this case, the the chlorine's coming straight towards us, bromine's going straight back. In this one, the bromine's coming straight towards us, and the chlorine's going straight back. So, what's the relationship of these? Um, two molecules. Now, how did, how did I kind of like construct this one from this? Well, I kind of what I did was I I I I kept the two the CH three and the H constant, and I took the stuff on the carbon and I and I swapped the orientation, right, the direction of those things. So I hold two substituents constant and I swap the other two, and these molecules are called non superimposable mirror images non superimposable mirror images and the molecules are called chiral so when a molecule has this property of having non superimposable mirror images we call the molecules chiral. And the, so this molecule, both of these molecules are chiral. These are not the same molecule, right? They're non-superimposable mirror images. I'll show how they're mirror images in a second. Um, but for now, uh, you can clearly see they're non-superimposable. Like, I can't put this on top and say, oh yeah, they're the same thing. They're, because they're not. These are different molecules, right? Okay. Um, All right, so let me let me show these two molecules to you, right? Kind of remember the structure. You have it written down, right? You have CH3, and we have uh, chlorine and bromine on you know on one, and bromine and chlorine swapped on the other. Let me let me show you these with my models now. All right, and this is something you guys can do with your own models too. I, I would recommend making a model of the two things I just showed you. The, kind of the left molecule, which I'm calling gr uh, chlorine is green and Br is red. It's kind of the left molecule I just showed you, and then here is the uh, right molecule I just showed you. So they, you know, they they look kind of similar, but now you can look at the three dimensionality and see that they don't superimpose. I can't put them on top of each other and make them be the same molecule. Okay, that's pretty easy to see, right? Um, another way to see, and, and I, I'm calling them non-superimposable mirror images, right? They're mirror images of each other that are non-superimposable. So a way to see that is I just take the two molecules and I kind of, kind of put them at each other's side and now I'm like, oh yeah, they're totally mirror images, right? See how they're mirror images? They're mirror images, right, that are non-superimposable. Because when I try to superimpose them, they don't superimpose, right? See that? Totally do this with your own models. You can kind of visualize this. 
Okay, they're non super. They're super. Sorry, non superimposable mirror images. Non superimposable mirror images. There's two ways to show it. One is uh, to kind of you know line them up and show that they're non superimposable, right? The other is to actually put them kind of next to each other and then see. Oh well, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're totally. They're mirror images, right? They are mirror images, but they're non superimposable. All right. Okay, so we discussed these molecules. They're uh, non-superimposable mirror images. The molecules are called chiral. Um, there's another word I'm going to introduce. I'm going to uh, call these enantiomers. Enantiomers. An enantiomer is um, like the right molecule is an enantiomer of the left. The left molecule is an enantiomer of the right. So enantiomers specifically are non-superimposable mirror images. Non-superimposable mirror images. I'm going to go through definitions again in a bit, but that's a, that's a uh, a pretty simple idea that you know when you have when you have a non-superimposable mirror image of uh, a molecule, it's called an enantiomer. It's a relationship. Okay. All right. Um, what about what about these two molecules? Okay, it kind of looks like one of the ones I just drew. And if I draw. This. The question I'm going to use. This looks like a resonance arrow, but I'm, I'm just trying to ask: What's the relationship of these molecules? When I look at these, are these non-superimposable mirror images, or, or what is the relationship of these two molecules? What's the relationship about these? It looks like chlorine is kind of coming towards us, and maybe to the left a bit, and the bromine's going away and to the right. Here, the bromine's kind of going away to the left, and the chlorine is kind of coming towards us and to the right. So what's the relationship? Are these non-superimposable mirror images? Yes or no? What's the relationship? So this is where you have to, you have to uh, remember what I just said a second ago. Remember when I said like the left and right here is meaningless. It's meaningless. It looks like chlorines to the left, BRs to the right, and BRs to the left and chlorines to the uh, right. And is that is meaningless. The, the true meaning of this is chlorine is coming straight towards us, bromine is going far away from us. Bromine here is going far away and then chlorine is coming straight towards us. These are identical. These are the same exact molecule. Okay? These are the same exact molecule. And um, I can try to show that with my little models too. So I'm going to show you these two things and to show you that they're identical, right? Alright, so 
uh, look at the molecules we just talked about. You should have them drawn down in your notes, right? So this is what I'm calling the, the left molecule. Um, I, I should mention that uh, I'm going to show two, two models. These are slightly different from the previous models I showed you because uh, I, I did change them a little bit. But these correspond to what's in your note that we just talked about in your notes, right? So it looks like if I'm looking at this, the chlorine is the green one, right? And the bromine is the red one. Um, it kind of looks like, oh yeah, the chlorine is coming towards us and offset to the left, right? Right? The, le the chlorine is kind of offset to the left, the bromine looks like it's offset to the right. And then the right side molecule I just showed is this one. And I, I'm just going to spin it a bit and I'm like, oh yeah, well that looks like bromine is kind of to the left in a way and the chlorine is coming uh, towards us and to the right. These are the same molecule though, right? Those are identical. There's no, these are not any antimers or non-superimposable mirror images. These are super, superimposable. These are identical molecules that are superimposable, right? So my point is that if I look like a, at a molecule like this and I draw it kind of like that, or I look at, at it like that, that's the same thing, right? This is the same as this. Don't be misled by the little left-right orientation of the of the wedged and dashed substituents. This is the same as this. I'm just looking at it from a different angle, right? So, yeah, these are the same molecule. And it doesn't matter if I wrote, if I look at it from this way or that way, okay? Okay, just to reiterate, these are the identical molecules. In that little offset of left and right of the CL and the BR is meaningless. What matters is the fact that the chlorine is coming towards us and the BR is going away from us. Chlorine is coming towards us, BR is going away from us. And thus these are identical molecules. Okay? Just wanted to be very clear about that. Okay, so now we're getting into the numbered sections of this chapter. First one is chiral molecules. Everything until now is just kind of introduction. We're still kind of introducing, but let's let's uh, formally define a chiral molecule now. A chiral molecule is a molecule. that is not superimposable on its mirror image. A chiral molecule is a molecule that is not superimposable on its mirror image. And we could say it's an adjective. As a figure of speech, it's an adjective, right? Okay. And it, a chiral molecule typically requires an sp3 hybridized carbon. with four different substituents. And the examples we just showed all have that kind of uh, situation. Let's draw a couple examples now of chiral molecules. And they have sp3 carbon with four different substituents, all right? So one example. Pretty simple one. That's a carbon in the middle, of course, and we have an H, a Cl, a Br, and an F. Those are four different substituents. Um, now, to show this mirror image relationship, this is a chiral molecule. 
Um, I am. I like to do this. I say en for enantiomer. En. Uh, I'm going to draw the enantiomer of this, right? So there's a couple ways to show this relationship, and I am going to. Just draw, imagine that what the mirror image would look like. Like the mirror image, you know, if I have a, imagine a mirror plane there, I'd have a fluorine, right? An H. Okay. So this is the enantiomer. You can see the mirror image, how it's a mirror image. Like the, that mirrors that. The chlorine is coming towards us. The chlorine is coming towards us here. The Br is going away. The Br is going away. And the H is, you know, in a mirror, like if you have, imagine a mirror being right there and you're, you're looking into the mirror, like we're, stand, we're standing over here looking into the mirror of this molecule, this is what you'd see, right? These are enantiomers. These are non-superimposable mirror images. Now there's another way we can draw the enantiomer. If I just take it and I flip it over, I take it, I, I take it out, flip it over on top of it, it's, it Itself. Take it and flip it over, what does it look like? If I take it and flip it over, now the H is on the left and the fluorine's on the right. Right? But if I took it and I flipped it over, the chlorine was coming towards us, now the chlorine's going away, right? And the bromine was going away, now the bromine's coming towards us, right? So these are identical molecules. All I did is I took it out of the page and I flipped it over. And now I get this. Now you can kind of see what we saw before. Oh yeah, H and F, those line up. No, but chlorine is coming towards us, bromine's going away. Here, chlorine's going away and bromine's coming towards us. So these are identical molecules. And we just, what my point here is that there's multiple ways to show what the enantiomer looks like. That these are, you know, this is, this is the molecule. This is the enantiomer drawn in two different manners, right? Let's try it. Let's try another one. Okay, so I'm gonna draw two butanol CH2. Actually, I'm gonna draw this. Little, I'm gonna draw it over here. Okay, sorry. Let's try this again. H3C. I need space. I need space. All right, CH2, CH3, all right, so first of all, is, is this chiral? I mean, what is our requirement? We require sp3 carbon with four different substituents, right? Well, there, there it is, <laughs> sp3 uh, carbon with four different substituents. It's got an OH, an H, a CH3, and an ethyl group, right? So that's clearly the requirement for chirality. Um, and what would, what if it is chiral, what does it have? It has an enantiomer, right? And there's a, always a couple ways we can draw the enantiomer. There's probably a, a million ways we can draw the enantiomer. It's just a d different ways of drawing the same thing. So one way to show the enantiomer is just draw the kind of mirror image of it. So now the mirror is like methyl, and then we have CH2, CH3. In the mirror, though, the hydroxy is still coming towards us, and the uh, H is coming away, right? So th this, these are enantiomers. These are not the same molecule, right? Because in the mirror, in the mirror, um, if the mirror is right there, the CH3 is close to the mirror, and then the hydroxy is still coming away, I mean, towards us. And then we have the CH2 and the CH3. So if you imagine a mirror right there, this is what the mirror would show. And these are enantiomers, they're not the same molecule. But, like always, I can, there's an there's a, a operation I can do to draw the enantiomer in a different manner. I can take it and flop it over. Take it and flop it over, and that'll allow that'll look more aligned with this molecule, right? If I take this and flip it over, it's going to look closer to this, right? So now it's going to look like we have the ethyl on the left, H three C C H two methyl up here, right? 
but what, what's the orientation of the hydroxy group? Because if I took this molecule and I flip it over, it, OH was coming towards us, now OH is going away from us. So that's another way to show, these are, these are the same molecule, just drawn in different representations, where I flopped it over. I flop it over. Same molecule, but flopped over. Now I look at the, what I started with, and I look at this, and I'm like, well, now I can easily see that the, oh, the hydroxy group is coming towards us in this case, and going away there, right? Okay, so that's, that's kind of cool. All right, let's draw another one. Let's draw isopropyl alcohol. Isopropyl alcohol. All right, so immediately, if I if I look for the four unique substituents on the central carbon, I get confused because there are not four unique substituents. It looks like, oh, we have, you know, the methyls are one, two, three, and four. It's actually only three unique substituents. So this will not work. And if I, if I draw, like, the mirror image of this, let's draw the mirror image of it. Are those different molecules or the same? <laughs> Just the same molecule, right? So these are not enantiomers. These are, if I write EN, I put X, those are not enantiomers, those are the same molecule. Same molecule. Because it doesn't have the requirement of chirality. What's the requirement for chirality? Requires sp3 carbon with four different substituents, unique or different substituents. Okay, So isopropyl alcohol does not have that, and these are the same. And of course, I, if I take this and I flip it over, what does it look like? Well, these are all the same molecule. Because I take the, if, if I took this, flip it over, you know, is it, is it still, is it different than this? Well, these are, they're the same, because I can flip this over and get back to here. These are all the same molecule. Okay, so is it chiral or not? Is it chiral or not? It's not chiral. Because to be chiral, you you need to have enantiomers. You need to have uh, non-superimposable mirror images, right? So what's the opposite of chirality? Achiral. Or you could say it's achirality, right? But yeah, achiral. These, all these molecules are achiral. Achiral. All right. Cool. How about... Let's try this. All right, so that's uh, two bromopentane, right? One, two, three, four, five. Two bromopentane. Does it have the requirements for chir of chirality? Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's got a, a carbon with four unique substituents, right? You have the methyl, you have the H, you have the Br, and you have a propyl group over here. Yeah. So it should have an enantiomer and and. Like I, I like to do this. I, I like to draw the enantiomer in a couple different formats. One is kind of the mirror image method. So I'm like, well, if if this if these things mirror each other, then what does the mirror image look like? Well, it looks like Br, right? These are not the same molecule. These are enantiomers. Okay, and I can also take this and flip it over. And when I do that, it'll look closer to what I started with. So, if I take this and flop it over, how many carbons is it? It's still five, right? So it goes one, two, three, four, five. And now if I take this in antimer and I flip it over, and now the BR is actually going away. So yeah, these are the same molecule. These are the same. These are, but, you know, there are basically two enantiomers, right? This, and these guys are the same molecule drawn in different orientations. But they're different. That is different than these guys, right? Because they, they're non-superimposable mirror images. Okay. All 
Alright, so wrapping up, but I, I want to mention one more thing. Um, looking at our previous examples, uh, sometimes it's nice to, uh, when we have these carbons with four different things on them, there, there should, let's give that a name, right? You got a carbon with four unique substituents. So I'm going to put a little asterisk there. That's a useful thing. Little asterisks. Okay? And we're going to give that a name also. So the, we call it a chiral carbon, maybe. Chiral carbon. It's the, the, the carbon that provides chirality, right? It has some names sometimes. Called. An asymmetric carbon. There's multiple names for this concept. <laughs> Sometimes people call it an asymmetric carbon. Sometimes people call it a stereocenter. Sometimes people call it a stereogenic center. I think the the true nerds usually call it a stereogenic center. I think that's the the uh, kind of the most correct uh, one. Um, chiral center chiral center is another one. I, I usually use chiral center um, even though there's some issues with why you'd want to not call it chiral center but but yeah that's a, that's a pretty easy thing I, you know for us to kind of visualize. It's like yeah yeah that's a chiral center that's a chiral center that's a chiral center. It's a carbon with four unique substituents but depending on where you you know which book you're using there's a couple ways couple names people give these things. Uh, okay, so chiral molecules are always partnered with a molecule. Chiral molecules are always partnered with a molecule called an enantiomer. We already said that. An enantiomer, which the definition of an enantiomer is a non-superimposable mirror image. Non-superimposable mirror image. A non-superimposable mirror image, okay? Alright, and what I'll do lastly is we'll, we'll just draw a couple molecules and, and just point out the chiral centers or stereogenic centers, alright? Pretty easy. Okay, so this is an amino acid called alanine. One of the components of proteins, amino acids. Where's the stereocenter or stereogenic center? It's right there. And there's an, there's always an H. Well, there's an H there. I'm not showing the H. That's okay. What about another amino acid called glycine? It's an amino acid. It's got an amine and a carboxylic acid. Well, this has two H's, and there's no there's no chirality. This is this is chiral. Alanine's a chiral amino acid. This is an achiral amino acid. So this is a chiral amino acid. This is an achiral amino acid. Okay. A um, couple other molecules. Okay, so this one on the left is called S plus carbon. The one on the right is called R minus carbon. We'll explain the S and the R and the plus and the minus a little bit later. But these are enantiomers. Uh, where's the where's the chiral center or stereogenic center? Where is it? It's probably the thing with the dashes and the wedges. That's it's right there. Yeah, star. 
stars. So there, that's where the difference in chirality or in three dimensionality is. That center, right? Here you have a, and this thing on the bottom, this alkene and the TH3, that's a freely rotatable group. It can rotate around the single bond. So the alkene could be on the point to the right, the alkene could point to the left, etc. But these are two different isomers. Um, this, in, interestingly, this is found in caraway. Caraway. It's like a uh, herb. And this is found in spearmint. One's found in caraway, one's found in spearmint. And usually in class, I, I have little vials of these and I pass them around to like kind of blow people away by, you know, the, the structures are basically the same except the three dimensionality is different. But your nose totally detects these differently. They have massively different smells. This is a caraway. I don't know if you know caraway. It's like a, some people use it as a spice or an herb. Um, and then spearmint, like spearmint chewing gum, right? Yeah, they, they really, really smell drastically different. And th this is one sad thing I can't do with remote learning, unless I mail you guys vials of these and you can smell them at your house or something. But uh, you'll probably have to wait to be actually in the, the labs to smell these. Anyway, uh, we have a couple more and I'm going to do them next time. So, continuing onward, I'll show more, more examples of chiral centers and, you know, indicating them and then, and then we'll just kind of keep going. There's a lot, lot more to learn about stereochemistry. It's a really cool chapter. Alright, see you guys.